appreciate the invitation and opportunity to be here and appreciate your presence on this occasion, your interest in these topics. Wendell mentioned that uh, we first knew each other at Montgomery Bible School or now Alabama Christian College and a number of years ago and left you to guess which was which. Well, I'll just say that Wendell was one of my very early idols as a preacher, so maybe that'll indicate a little bit of the idea of uh, which one was which. <laughs> The task, as Wendell mentioned, is to try to discuss some of the key passages relating to the doctrine of ordination and election, predestination. Several of the passages were specifically assigned and we attempted to deal with them, but in reality this question involves so many passages and concepts spread throughout the scripture that it's necessary to be broader than just those passages alone. Let's begin, though, by reading the passage assigned in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 14 really is the context, though three passages were chosen here. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. Then in verse 5, Having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then down to verse 11, in whom also we were made a heritage, having been foreordained according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. The principal problem and conflict under consideration in these verses at this time is simply that of the question of free will, free moral agency, versus predestination or foreordination in the particularistic sense. The idea and doctrine as presented by Calvin that uh, God foreordained and predestined before the world began the name and number of those who would be saved. Now, this conflict has had a long history and impossible for us to go into all of that. The view, though, of deterministic predestination as set forth by Calvin has had a tremendous impact on religion in Christendom in Europe and in America, at least the past five centuries, Calvin defined predestination as the eternal decree by which uh, uh, God had made and by which he has decided with himself what is to become of each and every individual before the foundation of the world. On the other hand, of course, Arminius, Wesley, and others modified and directly opposed the Calvinistic interpretation, and these expressed a view in favor of free will and free moral agency, and has constituted a conflict in Christendom that still goes on. In attempting to arrive at which of these is the correct view of these verses, it is essential that we exegete God's Word properly. And this is true with all of the study that we do of God's Word. And there are five essential areas that must be dealt with thoroughly in studying any passage of God's Word and arriving at it uh, correct meaning. 
we must exegete lexically, that is, we must understand the meaning of the words as they were used by the original author and as they would have been understood by the original audience. We must exegete syntactically, that is, we must understand the language and grammar and syntax as was understood by the original author and by the original audience. We must exegete historically. We must sit where they sat. We must return ourselves to the situation of the author and the audience as it was originally presented. And we must then exegete contextually, study carefully the broad context and the immediate context, and exegete harmoniously, which simply means that the Bible as a whole is the whole context. No interpretation can be placed on one particular passage that is not in harmony with the overall teaching of the Bible. Brother Deaver earlier was pointing out or making a statement along this line that was very good in, in the point that if the Bible says women are to teach, the Bible says women are not to teach, there is to be a harmony understood between these so that consequently there must be some special situations understood in terms of when it's talking about women teach or women not teach. And consequently we must interpret every passage harmoniously with the Word of God as a whole. And this is a very key point in understanding what is the proper view about the biblical teaching on election, coordination, predestination. Let's begin then with some key word studies that uh, need to be looked at. The first key word to be examined is the word that is translated uh, elect, election, and so forth. Electos is uh, a form of the Greek word that is used that is uh, translated elect or select and various other synonyms used some 23 times in the New Testament. Another form is ekloge, and this form is uh, used as a noun. The first form is used uh, as a noun sometimes in a, or deriving from a participial form, but ekloge is the noun form. Uh, there is an error here that is my fault in the book in which adjective got in there when I said uh, uh, Peter and meant Paul or whatever I was thinking about, and I never even noticed it till I looked at the book and uh, saw it there, but at any rate, it should be noun. And <clears throat> this word uh, is used some seven times in the New Testament. Then the verb form, eklegomai, meaning to elect or to select, is used some 21 times. Now, actually, only one of these passages that uh, we're dealing with has a form of this word in it. But you can see that some 51 times this word is used throughout the New Testament, and so uh, in many of them it is just as key in other passages as in this particular one. Now the word uh, basically simply uh, has to do with the act of selecting. Uh, literally, the verb form could be translated, I say out or I pick out, I choose out. And so it could be used from all kinds of situations. Uh, in Luke 6, 13, Jesus chose 12. Now, the disciples were elected, and they became elect. But this has nothing to do with the idea that before the foundation of the world, they were elected are chosen. They were elected or chosen at the point when Jesus reached that point in his personal ministry. The uh, passage in Luke 10, 42 talks about Mary has chosen the good part. She had elected, selected, picked out the function and role 
and activity and service that Jesus describes as the good part. So predestination in the sense of Calvinistic, deterministic predestination before the foundation of the world is not at all inherent in the meaning of these words. And if it is there, it would have to be put there by other adjectives and other modifiers and in the context in such a way as to present it. The uh, word is used a number of times of God's choice. In Acts 6, 5, 13, 17, 15, 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 28, and other passages. And in our passage under consideration in Ephesians 1, 4, it says, even as he chose, elected, selected us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. While the reference uh, here does include the idea of a choice made before the foundation of the world, the context also indicates that uh, the act or choice was as much centered on the kind of people elected and selected as on individuals. In other words, there is the modifying clause that is included here that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. And thus the overall emphasis of the context is selection made with respect to characteristics and not with respect to individuals. Individuals come in secondarily as individuals meet these characteristics. And so the passage is simply saying that God chose before the foundation of the world that those whom he would bless with every spiritual blessing would be the ones who would be holy and without blemish before him in love. Now, another key word is uh, the word that is translated determine or predestine. And this word is from the Greek word horizo. The basic root means to limit or to set limits, to fix or to appoint. And this verb form seems to be derived from the articular noun form, meaning the boundary. The key word is the form that puts pro in front of this, pro orizo. This occurs in the New Testament some six times, and four of these are in the text that are assigned for our consideration uh, today. Romans 8, 29 and 30, and Ephesians 1, 5 and 11. The word itself simply means that God predetermined or set beforehand certain bounds, certain limitations, or certain criteria to be met. E.W. Bullinger said of the word, when proorizo is used, the question is not who are its objects, but what are they predestined to do? Another word, then, that is uh, to be considered is hireomai. And this uh, word has to do with a taking up, a picking up, and then in the middle voice, it has the meaning of to take for oneself, or to choose, or to select for oneself. And consequently, when uh, Paul, and the pa word is used in the passage in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, that is one of ours, Paul said, God chose you as firstfruits unto salvation by sanctification of the Spirit and faith in the truth. That is, God picked or chose or selected. But here, the passage and the context have nothing to do with this having to do with foreordination or pre 
choosing sometime before these individuals were ever born or before these individuals ever uh, heard, for that matter, what it was that the gospel said. It is simply that God chose you. And furthermore, this passage has nothing to do with choosing them uh, in terms of the uh, idea as to being saved or lost. Now, a key problem with this passage is a textual problem. And that turns on the word of arcade. If we had the board, but it's moved. Uh, if you spell this word up, off of P or AP, with uh, an asterisk, uh, or with an apostrophe rather, and then RK, you have two words. And this is the way that the later text have it. And when it occurs in that way, it means from the beginning or from beginning. And so consequently, some of the versions have from the beginning. But the older Greek text and the cumulative work of textual criticism, the uh, textual critics are strongly agreed that it should be not two words but one, op arche, which then means first fruits and not from the beginning. And this, of course, puts an entire complexion upon the passage and what one would do with it. Now, what is involved then here is the fact that the passage is simply relating to God having chosen where and to whom the gospel should be preached in the area of Thessalonica. And these were given that benefit of Paul coming and preaching to them, and they being the first fruits to hear it, and then, of course, they responded to it. Now, from the above, it can be observed that there is nothing inherent in any of these key words to suggest that individuals were selected before the foundation of the world to be saved and others uh, selected or chosen before the foundation of the world to be damned. To determine if the passages under consideration teach such a doctrine, one would have to go to other grounds other than lexical basis. Uh, and uh, because the words themselves do not have this inherent idea. Now, this is where we move to the concept of exegeting harmoniously. Because in the fullest sense, the largest context of every passage of Scripture is the entire Bible. Since God is true, then his word is true. And there can be no contradiction between truth and the interpretation of a single passage of Scripture must be in harmony with the whole. Now, let's look at what the Bible teaching is as a whole concerning God, his interest in man, and man's uh, call and man's uh, ability to respond to God's call and so forth. First Timothy 2 and verse 4 says, God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Such a statement could not be made if God had before the foundation of the world so arranged things that some men could not come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. In uh, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, God's, uh, it is said that God does not wish any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Peter learned a great lesson about God's interest in Acts 10 and verse 34 and verse 35 in conjunction with the event with Cornelius. He learned that of a truth, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he who fears him and works righteousness is acceptable to him. Furthermore, from other passages of Scripture, it is made clear that God loves everyone, 
that he has acted so all can be saved, that Christ died for all. In John 3 and verse 16, you have the passage that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Christ demonstrated God's love, and he tasted of death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 6, he gave himself a ransom for all. The Great Commission indicates that God intended the gospel to be preached to all. And the invitation in Revelation 22:17 is extended to all. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. He who hears, let him say, Come. He who is athirst, let him come. He who will, let him come, take of the water of life freely. Consequently, all of these passages make clear that God's overall intent is that all men have a free and clear opportunity to salvation if they desire it and will respond to uh, the call. Calvin had, of course, presented the doctrine uh, in a systematic way, and he had to because his doctrine came to be like dominoes, that one part would affect another part and another part and so on. And Calvin's doctrine is generally summarized under the heading of the tulip doctrine, T for total depravity or original sin, and then the U for unconditional election, God before the foundation of the world, unconditionally elected who would be lost, who would be saved. Now there are some passages such as these that we're looking at that one in an isolated context and apart from the teaching as a whole could interpret or twist or uh, present in a way as to support the doctrine of uh, total depravity or original sin, such as Romans 5 is used, or the doctrine of uh, unconditional uh, election. But when you move to the third of these doctrines, limited atonement, this should have told Calvin you're on the wrong track in interpreting these other passages because there is nothing, not one iota of anything that anyone can really twist in the New Testament to imply or infer a limited atonement. But because a limited atonement was required by Calvin's interpretation of total depravity and unconditional election, he moved ahead and said the Bible taught limited atonement anyway. And this is a tremendous tragedy. You know, a lot of times people back into a false doctrine. You remember in the cooperation controversy a number of years ago, uh, so far as I've been able to track down and trace down, nobody ever heard of the doctrine of benevolence to saints only until that uh, doctrine of non-cooperation came along. But because of uh, the passages in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, these brethren had to back themselves into a position of teaching a doctrine of benevolence to saints only. And they would rather then have taken that doctrine than to have retreated on the other aspects of the doctrine which were false. And consequently, this was Calvin's problem here. And yet, the Bible must teach limited atonement if unconditional election is true. And uh, limited atonement is not true. Therefore, unconditional election is not true. Christ died for everyone. He tasted 
of death for all men. He died for you. He died for me. The doctrine of substitutionary atonement is as plain as it can be in those four words. Consequently, the atonement is not limited and the plain teaching is that election is conditioned by man's response and Calvinism is out of harmony with the scripture. Brother Robert Shank has done a monumental job in the work on this and I have his book down there and meant to bring it up, but there's no way we can exhaust this subject this afternoon. But I would urge every one of you to get Brother Shank's work, Elect in the Son, and to read it. And this is also a monumental example of what objective Bible study can do when one honestly, carefully, prayerfully approaches the uh, Word of God. Brother Shank was uh, in an environment and had been brought up in an environment that uh, took all the tenets of Calv Calvinism. But as he honestly studied his Bible and then studied it carefully and prayerfully, he has written a tremendous work in this area. There are also some very, very encouraging signs uh, developing out of this. A recent letter I had from Brother Shane indicated that he had uh, further confirmation from some other uh, co comments and indications he had earlier that uh, the position that is presented in his book, Elect in the Son, which is certainly the truth and the one that we are espousing, that this is now pretty well the standard position at Louisville Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. And that means uh, quite a change for uh, these professors there. And it is also coming to be more widely accepted by Baptist preachers, Brother Shank indicates. Uh, this presents a hopeful situation. Two years ago at the Evangelical Theological Society meeting uh, in Chicago, I heard uh, three papers in dialogue presented, one by Calvinist, one by an Arminian, and one by a Lutheran uh, in uh, presenting the different views and action and reaction to this question of election. And this topic is in dialogue among these people more and more. And uh, hopefully, uh, if we can reach out and contact and dialogue with some of these people, we might be able to uh, effectively used by the Shanks book and the restoration ministry and aspects of this sort to try to uh, win many who would be able to see the inconsistency of the Calvinistic tulip doctrines. <clears throat> As uh, we would then consider the points further here, uh, we might ask how is it then that Honest and good men who were seeking the truth came to believe in a doctrine so contrary to the Bible. And I think perhaps it might be that they had too limited a concept of the act of foreordaining and predestinating. There are at least two models through which the concept and act of foreordination, predestination, an election may be viewed. One model might be called the particularistic or individual model, and that's the one that Calvin used. But take this in a situation like a teacher in a classroom. In this kind of a situation, a teacher might foreordain and predestinate uh, what grades would be given in the class, and she might do so by saying, Everybody who sits in row A is going to get uh, a row one going to get an A, and row two is going to get a B, and row three a C or three and four, and five a D and six uh, then an F. Well, the students don't know this, and so they come in class and they take their seats, and they go through and they work throughout the semester. But at the end of the semester, they all get grades according to where they sat. 
Now, we obviously recognize that this would not be a fair way. And furthermore, uh, another variety of that, a teacher might simply have a list of the names of the students who are going to be in class. And before they ever come to class, she goes in and writes down the grade by every student's name according to whether she likes the name or doesn't. Now, that particularistic uh, method would uh, be totally unfair, even if he, she used some uh, kind of criteria like the IQs written by all their names, and she gives them a grade according to their IQs. That would be unfair. And we recognize that kind of an approach is unfair. But in essence, this is what uh, uh, Calvin said God did. And if such a system is so obviously unfair to us, how could we ever attribute such a system to uh, our God who loves us and cares for us as the Scripture teaches and presents? But a second model for foreordination, predestination, election would be the general model or the criteria model. And this is the model that teachers try to use at any rate. It is the idea that the teacher predetermines, preplans, foreordains what skills, what knowledge, and so forth a student should attain in the class, and then says that those who attain these skills and this knowledge to a 90% proficiency will get an A, or an 80% proficiency or better will get a B, and so on. Now, this then is a criteria model, having set certain standards that should be met and then providing the encouragement, the exhortation, the call, the opportunity to meet those standards. And this would be a fair and just model. Uh, there are many illustrations, such as the Dallas Cowboys' uh, criteria for drafting their first draft pick and all the rest, or many others that would go into this area. They predetermine the kind of characteristics that a player must meet to be selected by them in the draft. Now, God's predestination, God's pre-planning is according to the criteria model. It is a just and a fair one. Now, looking at these passages then more specifically that are under our consideration, in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, when Paul says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish or unblemished before him in love, then he is stressing the idea that character is involved, criteria of holiness, criteria of uh, unblemished nature is suggested by this. And consequently, when uh, God uh, made that kind of decision and chose that those who would be blessed by him with all these spiritual blessings would meet those characteristics. In this way, all have the opportunity to conform themselves to these characteristics. When Paul says further down, having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, he's stressing that God predetermined, preplanned, foreordained that those who would be holy and without blemish would be adopted as sons. This is the second model or the criteria model. It would be the model that is used by an adoption agency for selecting parents for a child. It would be the model used by parents in uh, conjunction with an adoption agency and the children there. Parents usually decide something about the criteria of the child they want to select, how old he will be. Sometimes they even get down to selecting such things as color of hair, color of eyes, uh, if they're very uh, particularistic in uh, their nature and interests. But likewise, the adoption agency 
uh, selects characteristics for parents. And in this fashion, God predetermined uh, the matter and aspect of who would be adopted as his children. Now, in verse 11, Paul says, "...being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will." That is, his purpose or his pre-planning. And we have been predestined according to his purpose or his pre-planning. But it is in terms of characteristics. And when you go throughout the Bible again and see how often it is emphasized the kind of characteristics that we are to have, the fruits of the Spirit, and all of these kinds of things, it's obvious that God is concerned with having set characteristics and then people have an opportunity to conform to these characteristics. In uh, the other passage, Romans 8, 28 through 30, this passage can be viewed from either of the two models, but if it is viewed from the first, the particularistic, it is in contradiction with the Scripture. Looking at it from the second model perspective, we would say, whom he foreknew. God indeed foreknew everyone before he came to into existence. And thus every individual God pre-planned and intended and wanted and desired that every individual would conform himself to the image of his Son. Every Christian parent foreordains, predestinates, predetermines something about what their children will be. Now sometimes as parents and human, we predetermine too many things, like maybe what kind of occupation, what kind of hobby, and so on they might have. We don't allow them enough freedom to choose within right things. But it is right for Christian parents to predetermine, pre-plan for their children that they will have certain characteristics like love, kindness, courtesy, and all of these kinds of things, and then try to work exhortation, teaching, example to lead them into that situation. God then foreknew everyone, and he intended, pre-planned, predetermined, foreordained, that everyone should be conformed to the image of his Son. And then he proceeds uh, to point out that he also did predestinate or determine to be conformed. And then whom he did predestinate, he called. And whom did he call? He called everybody. The scripture indicates he has called everybody. But then there is a special group who come to be in the category of the called or the chosen. And those are the ones who respond to him, and the scripture then gives them the designation of the called or the elect because they responded, not because they're the only ones who were called. All were called. <clears throat> and then whom he called he justified. Those who came to be the called were justified. Brother Shank, in his book, Elect in the Son, in chapter 5, gives an excellent and thorough exegesis of this passage. And let me urge you to look at that. He takes this phrase, whom he called, and demonstrates extensively how the call was issued to all but only those who responded came to be designated the call. One quotation from him is worthwhile at this point. Calvinism's assumption that God had limited the effectiveness of the gospel call to certain individual men arbitrarily and unconditionally chosen to be the heirs of salvation rests in part on the fact that in numerous scripture passages the words called and calling have reference specifically to believers. Such passages, however, simply reflect the fact that those who respond affirmatively to the universal call become, in a particular sense, the call. In like manner, those in whom God's universal purpose of election becomes realized 
are spoken of as the elect in contrast with the rest of mankind. Reference to believers as the called and the elect does not in any way imply the positive unconditional reprobation of other men. The corporate election of Israel to temporal privilege did not constitute the reprobation of the rest of the world. For the way uh, always was open for all men to become uh, in relation to God. Furthermore, Israel was called to be God's channel of blessing for all mankind. So in like manner, the corporate election of the church does not constitute any reprobation um, of the rest of mankind. And on he goes. And then he proceeds to develop other ideas uh, in this passage, and I'll pass over that. You have it in the book. The thought in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 we've already dealt with and is corrected by the uh, matter of the correction of the text when this is read first fruits instead of from the beginning and means God chose to give them opportunity. Acts 2.23 is a passage that uh, does not really relate to this, though sometimes people attempt to. It is simply saying God, before the foundation of the world, or God predetermined that Christ would be crucified. Yes, he did. But that has nothing to do with soteriological election. The Bible teaches four kinds of election. It teaches theocratic election, that God operated through Abraham and his descendants to bring about certain things. It teaches messianic election, that God elected to send a Messiah in the world, and he elected before the foundation of the world to redeem men through the blood of Christ. The Bible teaches official election, that is, that he elected certain individuals for certain tasks, and uh, like Josiah to cleanse the idolatry of the northern kingdom, or like Esther to assist in delivering the people, or that uh, he selected John the Baptist, but our time fails us to have opportunity to go into all of this, and this is the closest kind to soteriological election, but it is clearly distinct, uh, a distinction between official election and soteriological election. The Bible teaches soteriological election, but it does not teach it in the way that Calvinism presents it. It teaches that God saves those whom he calls and who responds to his call, and they become the elect. Uh, I appreciate your attention and the opportunity to study with you on these matters, and hopefully uh, this and the study of Brother Shank's book will help you very much to deal with this problem and those that you might be able to help in the world today. Thank you very much.